Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Genesis Blog podcast. It's been a while, we know. Um, the last month or so has been quite hectic for all of us. Um, two of us have actually gotten surgery, um, and besides the crypto market, we needed a break from the crypto market, um, at least as much as we could take. <laughs> But nevertheless, we're back with another episode. Um, today we're going to talk about um, new order DAO. So this is going to be our first. um dow analysis if you will uh so full disclosure before we hand it over to sid uh the three of us are currently contributors at the new order dow we've written a couple of articles for them and we're also planning on working with the venture team uh, as contributors in the future uh but at the same time we don't hold any of the dow's native token um so yeah just a financial disclosure before we get started over to you sir perfect Perfect. Thanks, Yash. Uh, yeah. Um. So today we are going to talk about New Order DAO. So, um. Firstly, what what exactly is New Order DAO, right? Um. So New Order is a venture incubator DAO. Um. That aims to build and grow DeFi protocols. Um. So it provides them with growth opportunities, networking, fundraising, functional and technical support, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um. So. why exactly do we want to analyze new order dao well it's because it plays a pretty unique role in the dao ecosystem today um and it's actually replicating some of the structures from the traditional world in in the way that venture capital is organized uh, so if you actually think about venture capital um th- there's vcs that uh, you know traditionally invest in startups provide them with support and growth opportunities right in the real world but that model is it it operates essentially a, a, across a scale so there are some vcs that operate on a very light touch basis um so you know they have a very light touch approach to interacting with and providing support to founders so if you've heard of tiger global that's their model so they just write a lot of checks but they don't actually uh you know do any of the other stuff apart from investing in uh in in a startup and on the other ha- on the other hand the other side of things um they are uh you know Uh, there are vcs that play a very hands on role in building and growing the startups that they've provided capital to so they you know they they infuse the startup with capital but they also provide their expertise their connections their knowledge um also sometimes augment resources of the startups that they work with and the right hand side of this model if the tri- tiger global uh, side is left is um it's most commonly referred to now to um, venture incubators accelerators and builders so yeah we're we're aware that it's slightly confusing terminology but you can just um think of it in essence as the venture development model um so you know the venture accelerator accelerators incubators and builders mostly just differ um based on the time scale in which they support startups so for example an accelerator will be a much shorter time period so it'll be like maybe you know 3 months an incubator will be slightly longer and uh, and a venture builder or a venture creation studio actually helps a startup for a much longer time period maybe like a year or two um to help develop its uh, pro- services and products uh so in in that vein uh new order dao can be thought of mostly as a venture incubator slash accelerator slash builder um let's just simplify that let's call it the venture development model uh so it's a venture development dao right uh so in the in the dao ecosystem today this plays a pretty uh, unique role so in the, the the dao ecosystem today has many different types of dao so there's you know there's protocol dao so you got things like your aave maker uh, goldfinch you know many of the defi protocols that are constructed um whose governance is operated on as a dao then there are other there are other ones there's there's grants dows so there's ones like gitcoin um there's you know um aave grants there's uh you know rareable grants compound grants so many of the um many foundations and many organizations have come together to actually provide grants to the rest of the ecosystem and they structure the process of giving these grants out as a, a, in in a dow um other examples of daos are you know investment daos so you've got um you've got things like alliance dao or seed club ventures um you've got bit dao so like uh, quite a few of these are actually pooling together capital 
and uh, and just investing it in startups. And I guess that this is slightly similar to new orders um, to to new orders uh, you know model. But actually, what new order does differently is that it doesn't really provide any capital. It just provides growth uh, gr growth uh, exp uh, opportunities, networking, fundraising. Um, and a couple of other activities such as token design and protocol architecture and development and security to the uh, to the startups that it, and to the projects that it incubates, right? Um, so given that there are no uh, no true DAO like or on chain competitors to New Order, um, it seems like it occupies a niche in the space and might be just the first iteration of how a venture development DAO could actually look like uh, in in you know. Uh, in the on-chain blockchain world. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, it, the the venture incubator model, it was uh, popular, popularized in Meetspace or in the in the off-chain world um, by Y Combinator. And I'm sure everyone's heard of Y Combinator. It's one of the largest um, and most successful accelerators out there. Um, and uh, what New Order is trying to do is be, in, be a decentralized DAO version of uh, a Y Combinator. Um, and I, I think that that's a pretty interesting space to play in. And it, it certainly, uh, you know, it meshes in with our interests at Genesis Block because uh, we all, um, you know, work in work in the investment space. We all work, um, you know, we, we all want to help startups um, across the crypto ecosystem um, build and develop. So, um, you know, New Order is a pretty uh, good DAO for us to get involved in. It's why we've chosen um, you know, to start contributing uh, to it, uh, you know, bit by bit and and hopefully more over time. So, uh, yeah, what New Order is trying to do is to build an incubator for uh, DeFi projects. Uh, yeah. Just to, sorry to cut you off, but before we get into the details, I just thought it would be good for the audience. Um, if we just quickly run over what a DAO is, um, really briefly, I'm not sure if we have in previous conversations. Um, yeah, I think yeah, I think like we might have run run over what a DAO is um very initially, but actually yeah, uh, good point. So a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, so what this means is that um in a DAO, it's actually like not the simplest question to answer because people can have many different interpretations of what a DAO might actually mean. Um, but what it traditionally means and um in this space is that. The governance is run in a decentralized manner. So in essence, there are as many contributors as possible uh, that are voting on the decisions made to move the DAO forward. So it's 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 a it's a it's a way of bringing together disparate people from all across who don't necessarily need to know each other to actually collaborate to work together and to to in in the in layman's terms to build a company and grow it together, right? Um, but what the difference is in a, in the decentralized aspect of a DAO is that all the contributors to the DAO, essentially the employees, are also the owners of the DAO. And they're usually the owners by means of the native token of the DAO. Um, so, for example, um, if you hold the native token of the DAO, you will be able to vote in uh, vote, on, vote on decisions that uh, that are critical to the DAO's future. Right. So, for example, if you want to, let's say, um, you know, decide on the branding. Decide on the marketing. Decide on the product that the DAO is building. Decide on you know the service providers employed by the DAO to help it grow. All of these are decisions that uh, token holders of the DAO's native token can make and vote on uh, to drive the further development of the DAO. And the second aspect of a DAO that is important is um, is the autonomous part. So what the autonomous part means is the uh, is that a lot of the DAO's decisions. And the way that the DAO executes its decisions are meant to be done via smart contracts. So they're meant to be, so you write up code. So let's say a DAO makes a decision. Um, let's say you want to, like in the case of Aave, for example, because I work as a um, delegate for Aave, if you want to, um, for example, change a risk parameter. So let's say you want to change the, um, you know, a borrow cap for a particular asset, or you want to list a new asset onto, um, you know, the, the Aave uh, v, V3 Ethereum marketplace, um, you submit a proposal, DAO members vote on it. If the proposal passes uh, on chain, um, it's got actually, it's got executable code written in the contract. Uh, so in the vote. So, ex so right when the vote passes on chain, that code can be, uh, that code can be executed a few hours after, or like just immediately after, depending on, you know, what the, the time lags are for that specific DAO. 
Um, so, so it essentially simplifies a lot of the mechanisms and it makes it a lot more trustless because when you're voting for that decision, um, you can see the, you can see the code that that's been embedded with that vote. So let's say that you're voting yes or no. If you vote yes, you can say, okay, this is exactly what is going to be implemented when I vote yes. And when this decision passes and that happens automatically, it happens in an automated fashion. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know if you guys want to add anything to the definition of a DAO from your perspectives. No, no, you want to add a definition of DAOs. I just want to extend it to why DAOs make sense for, you know, like a VC fund model. So traditionally a VC fund, um, the only way you can raise funding is either you raise funding from institutions or you raise funding from limited partners, right? And most VC funds today, they raise money from limited partners and limited partners are usually high net worth individuals, right? So the barrier to entry to get into VC investing or any kind of private equity investing is always usually very high and reserved for the top 1% of the people in the world, right? What a VC DAO does is it kind of democratizes that access, right? Because everything is on chain and the only, at least in the case of new order, the, the easiest way to get exposure to the new order portfolio is to just buy the new order token, which we talk about later. But that new order token gives you access to the revenues generated from uh, projects that new order has incubated because they take a cut of the tokens of the projects they're incubating, right? So that's a way to really scale the DAO because you can massively increase the number of people who can invest in the DAO and who can also become contributors to the DAO. Uh, so you can scale much faster than a VC fund and incubate a much wider range of projects by onboarding more and more contributors and more and more investors at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and also one, one, one thing to keep in mind when it comes to DAOs is um, the decentralized and the autonomous part that Siddharth was mentioning. Um, they exist on a spectrum. So the level yeah. of decentralization and the level of autonomy um, differs from I think his uh, internet might have just paused a little bit yeah, there, probably. but 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 I think basically what Sid was trying to say was that the um, level of decentralization and autonomy of each DAO is not, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be consistent across each DAO. Um, each of them get you DAO. Know, they might operate on that scale uh, somewhere. Some might be more decentralized than others in their governance mechanisms. Some might be less so. Um, some might have decisions that that you know cannot be made autonomously. Um, and have to be, you know, um, and, and there needs to be some sort of manual element to it. Um, so it, it, all of it is a spectrum and it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, um, uh, each DAO will have the same level of um, decentralization and autonomy um, as the other one. It's already, yeah, I, I guess the, the goal, the goal for an investment DAO is not really, not necessarily like complete decentralization. It's more about democratization and ensuring the the right aspects which comes to handling funds is decentralized and executed through, through smart contracts to make sure there's no misappropriation of funds that are raised, right? So as long as funding and execution of funding happens on chain through votes, the rest of the DAO does not necessarily have to be decentralized and you can have some kind of corporate structure hierarchy even within a DAO. It doesn't have to be just kind of a free for all situation, right? Exactly. In fact, it, it's just, in fact, yeah. Hierarchy, I would say hierarchy is um, absolutely integral to a DAO. It's just about the fluidity um, of that hierarchy. It's not rigid as opposed to how it is in traditional organizations. Exactly. Yeah, in, there in, does, there yeah. does need to be like a top-down decision-making framework so that otherwise, like every single company needs some kind of leadership from somewhere or to kind of drive the vision forward. Otherwise... You know, if it's just everyone has equal amounts of power and everyone can make decisions, it won't go anywhere. It'll just kind of stagnate, which is one of the main problems with the current DAO model is that because you can vote and stuff on so many different things, it kind of leads to voter stagnation, which eventually leads to the protocol development stagnating. So you don't exactly. want to be in that situation, but you also don't want to be in the situation where everything is centralized. It needs to be kind of an amalgamation of the two. Exactly. And and just to build upon that point of, you know, what, when a DAO is most suitable, um, I was going to come um, come to this later on, but, but it might be worth, you know, just talking about it right now. But essentially, 
where DAOs excel most at is in aligning disparate individuals across geographies on a common mission, right? Um, so initially, at least like until the infrastructure develops and, you know, um, the people are getting more used to working in DAOs and start iterating on, um, you know, how it is actually to work in a DAO, making it more professional, all of those kinds of things. At least initially, the best suited use cases probably are the ones where there may not be an immense need for speed and scalability um, and where you can actually create a culture and propagate that culture across the DAO. So this, the culture itself is what binds contributors together and creates a community, right? So what New Order does well and what an investment DAO actually does well, well, or a venture development DAO actually does well, um, is that it can create a consistent culture which inculcates a community of like-minded individuals, right? And um, New Order has got a criteria of choosing projects. So um, we, we'll touch upon that criteria very soon. Um, but that criteria itself, uh, it, it, you know, it shows how it's attempting to create and define the type of DAO that it wants to be. And by creating that criteria itself, it's, it's, it's actually creating a bit of a culture. So um, it's creating, you know, an, an identity for itself of the types of projects that it wants to incubate and grow. And, and therefore it's bringing people who align with that mission into the fold, right? Um, and just another thing is that, you know, there is a need in the Web3 space for a decentralized incubator that stays true and close to Web3 ideals. Um, so New Order DAO definitely fills this gap as well. So therefore there is a, a space for New Order in this ecosystem. And, and I think that it, it's really important um, that, you know, a DAO like New Order has emerged and that it, you know, um, can potentially create a template for other venture incubator slash development DAOs to follow um, in the future. Cool. Anything else you guys want to add? I, um, otherwise, I will move on to uh, just some more information about New Order and then um, just touch upon the its its model briefly. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you should go. For it. Cool. Um, so yeah, just um, just some points is that um, New Order has raised $4 million from um, VC firms like Outlier Ventures, Digital Finance Group, and Ledger Prime, um, along with the Near Foundation. And what they've also done, which is great, is that they've raised $6.8 million um, from a Dutch auction that took place on uh, on SushiSwap's Miso Launchpad. So what that means is that they've got about you know $10.8 million in funding from when they launched. Um, seems like it's a healthy runway to last it through the bear market if it's managed well. Um, and it's and this backstop is actually pretty necessary um, because you know th what what New Order is aiming to do. Um, I'll just touch upon this very uh, uh, very soon as well. Is that it, it? It's aiming to invest its treasury in into yield seeking opportunities and grow its treasury through that, right? Um, so it's essentially an asset management type of um, a structure. But what what's actually happening in the in the DeFi space right now is that there's no good yields. Um, in the sense that there's no safe yield opportunities in DeFi today that a DAO can employ um, without taking the risk that, you know, all of its funds might just poof, vanish into thin air. Um, so given that um, the, the market today is not really suitable towards a very consistent and, um, you know, safe asset management strategy, this runway is pretty important for them, I think. And, um, and it should be enough, it, you know, um, it, it, it should be enough to help them grow slowly but steadily, and this might actually be pretty helpful for them um, to, you know, emerge out of the bear market stronger, well developed, and and ready for, you know, potentially new funding or just, um, you know, uh, going through, uh, you know, developing through the value of their treasury increasing um, as the value of the projects that they incubate increase as well. Um, so New Order aims to launch twenty to thirty projects per year. Um, I think that that's a bit ambitious. Um, I think it might stretch their resources quite a lot if they do that. Um, and um, having spoken to the New Order team, actually, I feel like they uh, they think that they also might have been a bit too ambitious uh, to begin with. Um, this this isn't really confirmed, but I don't really think that they're going to go after 20 to 30 projects a year. Um, and it just might make sense for them to, um, you know, uh, take a bit of a smaller number. And um, in the near in the near term, given the, again the state of the market, um, they, 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 they should more selectively choose the projects that they incubate. Um, so 
Yeah. So, and, and to date, the projects that uh, New Orders in, incubated are uh, redacted. So, uh, redacted cartel, which um, hopefully you guys have heard of, um, will, uh, it proved to be an instant hit um, at the end of 2021 and the start of 2022. Um, and I'll go more into detail about what each of these projects do. Um, so, they've got redacted, Optify, um, H2O, uh, Frogs Anonymous, and Y2K Finance. And they've recently, um, you know, in, they're in the process of bringing two new incubated projects into the fold, which are Motherboard and IVX. So I'll, I'll touch upon what each of these do um, a little bit later. But for now, I think um, the next important thing to know about New Order is its venture development model. Uh, so New Order has got uh, five criteria for the projects that it chooses to incubate. Firstly, it must have a focus on the Web3 ecosystems, pretty obvious. Um, it must aid in introducing new asset classes to DeFi, which is pretty interesting and, and you know, it signals their commitment to innovation. Um, it must be interoperable across chains. So um, not trying for, you know, an ETH only uh, thesis. They're actually, they've got a multi-chain thesis and, um, you know, the way that their governance is structured as well, it shows that they're trying to stay very true, true to it. Um, it's a new project and not a fork of an existing one. I think that this is very important because um, it really is a good filter of quality and, and essentially um, a good filter of the types of projects that it wants to incubate. Um, because just forking an existing, existing product is, you know, much simpler really than trying to actually build new code base and, um, and actually build a new product that can serve as a primitive across DeFi potentially. And it also leverages machine intelligence, which is automation essentially within its core smart contracts. Um, so, uh, you know, these criteria will help New Order filter through quite a lot of the projects that it wants to incubate. Um, and they're directed enough to be able to focus New Order's attention and primarily attract projects that meaningfully drive the DeFi space forward. Um, and I, in my opinion, the fourth criteria seems to be especially important. Um, because, you know, being directed to more effectively organize and exploit the money Legos that are in DeFi, um, it seems to be a lot more value creative to investors and to the overall DeFi ecosystem than just modifying existing code, right? And and I don't want to, you know, um, dunk on uh, forking a project too much because there are many good reasons to fork an existing project. Um, but if a venture incubator wants to attract the most innovative projects, it wouldn't be, you know, straight folks that do the job for them. Um, and yeah, um, not, not sure if you guys agree with that, but um, after I go through the next section, uh, the next part of it, maybe you can break for um, your thoughts. I, I personally think that forking only makes sense if you're forking uh, either because the protocol you're forking had some inherent, inherent flaws, that's why you're forking it to make it better, or you think you can drastically improve the protocol by forking and not through simple governance of the existing protocol because inherently forking kind of leads to fragmentation of liquidity right because for example when uniswap uh sushi swap forked from uniswap and just kind of took away liquidity from uniswap that was beneficial only really to sushi swap and no one else for traders mm -hmm. it, traders it was the worst experience because liquidity went from uniswap to being fragmented on uniswap and sushi swap and the more forks there are, the more you're fragmenting liquidity, no matter what the vertical is. So forking only really makes sense if it's drastically needed. Otherwise, I think it's kind of a step backwards and yeah. you're not really innovating or adding anything new to the space. You're just fragmenting it and dividing it more. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, and yeah, so what, what does uh, New Order actually give the projects that it incubates, right? So growth opportunities, networking, fundraising, token design and protocol architecture, and development and security. So we touched upon these earlier. And in return, New Order receives a portion of the token supply of its incubated projects. And, um, aim, and like I said before, it aims to earn additional yield by managing the supply through various DeFi strategies. Um, so what, all income that's received by New Order um, is and I'm quoting directly here, is intended to be used first to ensure the long-term viability of New Order and to fund continuing development and improvement of the New Order network. Um, so yeah, seems pretty standard um, from in, in that vein. 
Um, and you know, just as an example of the connections and visibility New Order brings to its incubated projects, is its partnership with Outliers Ventures, uh, with uh, with Outlier Ventures. So Outlier, they partnered with Outlier to launch a DeFi accelerator program. Um, the program lasts for three months and is targeted towards projects that are past the concept phase, and it offers quite a lot of perks for them. Um, and you know, you can imagine these perks being applied even more so to their incubated projects. So they give you know a DeFi mentor investor network, um, an optional interest-free loan, uh, expertise in token design, fundraising, business planning, pitch practice, legal support, marketing support, etc. So that's quite a lot of you know benefits for startups that go through this um, DeFi accelerator program, um, and quite a lot more so probably for the ones that go through um, you know that that are directly incubated by New Order. Um, and the first D5 Days Camp ended in July 2022 with a graduation of six projects, um, which raised a combined $3 million in three months, which is no mean feat. And, uh, you know, the next D5 Days Camp is due to be launched soon. And I think they've selected a cohort for it already. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's essentially it about, you know, New Order's model. So, overall, uh, I think one, that the model is pretty good. Yeah, go on. One, one thing I'll add on to this is um, this example of you know the collaboration between outlier and new order is at least to me i found very interesting because it shows that DAOs can you know interface with the traditional world if you will to really enhance the service that they provide because yeah. essentially what they do, they've outsourced their um whatever value add they're going to be but they outsource it to a you know a centralized entity and through that you know whatever combination i don't know what the exact commercial leader but whatever it, may, it is it seems to be helping all parties, right? So DAOs don't have to exist in this silo of this on-chain world. It can really, it, it really, uh, you know, increases its um, value add to the world when it interfaces with um, yeah. our existence. Yeah, and, and the um, partnership with Outlier may have been a bit of an easy layup for them because obviously like Outlier is an investor and the founder of New Order, um, whose name is Eden Dhalewal was actually the head of crypto economics at Outlier for three years before he, you know, left to found New Order DAO. So um, it, it's a bit of an easy win, but but definitely, you know, um, worth expanding this model um, to other VCs, to other interested parties who actually want to foster innovation in the DeFi space. And there's quite a lot of them. Um, so, you know, DAO to um, non-DAO collaboration, let's call it, um, is I think uh, uh, it, it's a pretty good thing that uh, New Order's done, in my opinion. Yep, agreed. Cool. Um, so next, I'll just walk through um, the incubated projects, um, you know, under New Order's wing. Um, so in this first year and a bit of ex uh, existence, so I think that New Order's incubated projects have undoubtedly innovated in the DeFi space. So you obviously start with Redacted. So Redacted Cartel was an instant hated launch, right? Um, so it's uh, its products are very quickly adopted. So it's got a couple of products, um, Hidden Hand and Pyrex. Um, and its tokenomics are also very well constructed. Um, and, you know, they incentivize users to hold and stake the native token butterfly to earn revenues. Um, and, you know, I'll go, go a bit deeper into um, Redacted in a second. Um, and, you know, the other projects seem pretty uh, promising. So, um, you know, Frogs Anonymous, it's it's gained some popularity recently. Um, and, you know, uh, we've also contributed to Frogs Anonymous um, by releasing a couple of our articles um, on, on the platform and are, are planning to contribute it, uh, to it, you know, uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, Y2K Finance also seems very promising and the products are also very interesting. Um, and, you know, New Order also seems to be expanding its scope outside of DeFi. Um, so you, you, it's illustrated in its selection of Motherboard to be one of its next incubated products. So Motherboard which, uh, develops DAO tooling and it aims to accelerate DAO development. So I think that they're expanding their scope to, you know, improve the overall space. So I, I think that that's a good thing and a bad thing, really, because if they it's a good thing because obviously, you know, providing support to entities that are deserving of it, regardless of the space they operate in is, is very useful, but also bad thing because it just, it just, you know, widens the, the focus a little bit um, in terms of, you know, um, it, it might stretch their focus a little bit. Hopefully it doesn't. And, you know, it remains to be seen whether they expand into a, a, a many, many different areas um, over the, over the, over the near term. I mean, longer term definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, 
you know, near term, you would hope that it doesn't actually shake their focus too much um, away from innovating in the in, in the DeFi space and you know, professionalizing an entire vertical of uh, Web three. Um, yeah. So yeah. One, 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 sorry, sorry to cut you off again, but just one thing on that. I think personally, I feel like the crypto space is getting so intertwined that it will only you know it only aid to benefit them because just focusing on pure DeFi is inherently limiting. Um, but if they focus on say DAOs as an example, because they're actually doing it, um, that, you know, the whole DAO space and the DeFi space and actually DAO space and any other space crypto, there's significant overlap because that's probably the organization. Yeah, definitely. Organized structure of choice. And similarly for NFTs as well, like there's a whole new trend of NFT Fi, right? Um, Game Fi, as we've already seen. So like there are a lot of these um, intersections that they can actually play in, which will make their overall service, uh, in my opinion, a larger value add. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like that's definitely not an invalid viewpoint, right? I think it makes sense. But in my opinion, I I I think that it's important to have focus on like one area. Um, but it's just a matter of personal preference. I think it's it's just more about you know. Um, I I think that specializing in a certain area gives you a lot more expertise. Um, and it also gives you a lot more you know heft in the decisions that you're making around that that space. Um, it, it, you'll also be able to hire like or attract contributors who are completely aligned to that one, you know, singular mission. Um, so I think that, you know, if you're trying to innovate in the DeFi space, you, you should continue doing that until you've perfected it. And then you, you know, diversify later on um, to other areas. But, but again, it's a matter of personal preference and, you know, um, try, trying to, trying to, you know, uh, incubate DAO tooling definitely is not some huge departure from what their initial mission is anyway. I guess it all depends on, you know, the the size of the new order network in general. So, I mean, yeah. for Kakar, they focus mainly on DeFi. So all the people that are contributors and are part of the core team of new order all probably have a DeFi background, which is why they wanted to work with new order in the first place. Now, new order yeah. wants to expand that to other areas like in Fi, NFT, whatever else they need to, hire people or they need to get potential portfolio companies in touch with people who could help them in the specific niche outside of DeFi that they were looking at. So that might yeah. not be as easy to do because they've already built out this entire network completely based on DeFi and to pivot away from that is a risk in itself. And in addition, it would be a lot more work spent on like hiring, looking for new people to contribute, looking for the right people. And also make like a lot of people, because it's all anonymous, it's we it's not as easy to verify people's credentials because on-chain credentialing is not like a full fledged in us here, it's still nascent, right? So it's a trade-off for them. And I think currently the winning side of this trade-off is probably just sticking to DeFi and innovating more and more in the space. Yeah, I would tend to agree. But again, like it's it this is not like a sticking point or anything at, at the moment. Um yeah, absolutely. This, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, just to touch upon a bit around, uh, you know, some of the, the different uh, projects that it, it's incubated. So Redacted, firstly, has got two, two key products, um, Hidden Hand and Pyrex. Um, so Hidden Hand is a bribe marketplace for DeFi protocols. So what a bribe marketplace is, is that um, protocols would deposit a bribe into the Hidden Hand smart contract. And, um, and this is distributed to users in return for their voting power. Um, and so for example, if I've got the ability to vote on a certain protocol, um, what, what I can do is that, um, if, you know, protocol a wants my voting power, they will basically bribe me for it. Like they'll pay me a nomin a certain amount, um, that, through the hidden hand smart contract through that marketplace. And I'll give them my voting power back. So I'll do basically, you know, um, I'll delegate my tokens to them or something, or I'll just vote according to, um, you know, what their preference is. Um, and it, it, it basically allows, um, and it, it, it's, you know, it aligns incentives between those who have excess voting power that they don't really care too much about. And those who don't have as much and would like to rent it. Right. Um, or like would want to use it for, a uh, for a certain amount of time. So let's say I'm a protocol and I don't want to buy that governance tokens for a particular proposal. Um, you know, and, uh, but, but I still wanted to, you know, I don't want to buy the, uh, buy the tokens because I don't want to hold it longer term, but I want a particular proposal to pass or I want, because it aligns closely to what I'm trying to do. Um, so therefore to essentially gain voting power for like my position, what I can do is I can just, 
um, utilize existing voting power of existing members or existing holders and direct that towards, you know, voting for the proposal that I want passed. So it's just a way of, um, you know, um, aligning incentives um, in, b between, uh, you know, different stakeholders. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, and, you know, hidden hands are primitive that's used across DeFi protocols. Um, and it, it was pretty easy to use and it, it had, you know, immediate product market fit. Um, so there was a lot of pro popularity, you know, just after launch. Um, and yeah, the weekly bribe fees, um, like, so, so in terms of, you know, actually for Redacted, Redacted takes a 4% fee from each bribe. So half is sent to the treasury and half is sent to those who lock butterfly in the protocol. Um, so essentially, you know, um, like pe people who hold lock butterfly, um, and the weekly bribe fees earned through hidden hand have been relatively consistent. Um, since April, uh, last year, um, the peak was reached in September, um, last year, but, but essentially the, the weekly bribe fees earned through hidden hand seem to have stayed kind of consistent. So it actually shows how the protocol has been used consistently throughout and e even in this bear market. So, which is a pretty good sign. Um, the second project that they, the product that they have is Pyrex. So what Pyrex does is that it creates liquid wrappers for illiquid tokens. Um, and they've got, um, a couple of main products. So one of them is related to convex, um, and the other one's related to GMX. Um, so the convex one is the most popular one. So what happens is, um, so I, I'm not going to go too much into the convex, into the way convex works, but basically, um, if you hold convex, just the, in this, the simplest way to understand this is if you hold convex, it's pretty valuable for, for protocols, um, because they get to, um, essentially uh, be able to bootstrap liquidity for their stable assets. Um, you, you don't need to know too much more than that. And that's a completely separate topic. Um, but uh, what happens is that users lock convex in exchange for PX convex. So it's, it's the liquid wrapper and, um, and, and yeah, Pyrex takes the convex, locks it to receive um, vote lock convex. And, um, and yeah, PX convex users get, um, you know, a bunch of, um, they, they eligible to claim revenue earned by Pyrex and boost the yields. Um, so yeah, both of the products have worked pretty well for redacted. Um, and yeah, the last one is the butterfly token. Um, and the butterfly token, um, actually has value backed by the intrinsic value of redacted's treasury and the revenues that are earned by the protocol. And it can be locked for, you know, re um, this revenue lock butterfly um, to basically share in protocol revenue. So, um, yeah, the, the, the redacted ecosystem is pretty well constructed and it shows how New Order is one of its main products basically has gained a lot of popularity and it shows how, you know, well constructed it actually is um, it, it, within the DeFi space and, and, you know, what the types of products that they're trying to incubate and projects that they're incub trying to incubate actually are going for. Um, which is well constructed tokenomics, alignment of stakeholders, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a pretty good um, indicator of, you know, new orders thesis. Um, the uh, I just like quickly run through the 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 other projects um, in new orders portfolio. So H two O um, is a stable asset backed by the Ocean token. Um, the Ocean token, I, I think we've spoken about it in our podcast and article on the Ocean protocol, but it's essentially the native token for this um, data marketplace. Um, in our article, actually, we walked through how the Ocean token itself doesn't really have too much intrinsic value. So in my opinion, this project that they've backed with, um, uh, this H2O project that they've backed is kind of risky. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in V2 of the project, I think that might be the one where value is truly unlocked because, um, you know, data token sets will be used as collateral for, um, the H2O token itself. So, um, if, if you want to read more about it, I think, uh, I, I, or like learn more about it, just go back to the podcast and, um, an article that we released about ocean, uh, but essentially, you know, using direct data tokens and uh, data sets as, you know, the backing for the H2O token actually, um, is, is a lot better. And it acts as a bit of an index for the best and most utilized data sets. Um, the third project is Optify. So Optify essentially um, is kind of like a year in finance and it optimizes yields across chains. Um, so, um, you know, cross chain, um, DeFi, new project. So, you know, kind of meets a lot of the criteria that new orders got. 
Um, fourth one is Frogs Anonymous, which we've touched upon. It's just a decentralized research collective where individual, disparate individuals just can, can just contribute pieces, where the quality, quality is ensured to stay consistent, right, by the Frogs Anonymous team. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that, that's pretty interesting. Um, the and the last one that they're already incubating is Y2K Finance. So Y2K Finance has actually created quite a stir since since launch in November 2022. Um, total deposits reached a peak of 10,000, almost 10,200 ETH, or so 13 million dollars in early December, and now they've settled at about you know three million dollars. So initially, probably because of liquidity mining or um, you know, um, incentives that were distributed to early participants. They must have reached a higher TVL, but still 3 million in about three months is really not that bad, especially in the market that we're in today. And the types of products that Y2K, you know, um, you know, y Y2K provides um, are, are pretty interesting. So they've got exotic peg derivative products. Um, so it enables participants to hedge on or speculate on the risk of a pegged asset or a basket of pegged assets, right? So for example, let's say um, they've got three products. So they've got one called Earthquake. So Earthquake is a structured product that creates, um, you know, fully collateralized insurance vaults that underwrite the volatility risk with pegged assets. So for example, if you've got a basket of stable coins and the stable coins deviate from the pegged assets, um, or, or, they, or you've got a real world asset and that real world asset deviates from the price of that, uh, of its underlying real world asset, then you get paid insurance out of that, which is pretty interesting. Um, and it's pretty necessary actually in this space. Um, and the other two ones, there, there's not a ton of information about them, but one is called Tsunami, which is a lending market for pegged assets based on the CDO type structure. And the last one is Wildfire, which is a an RFQ, so a request for quote order book for the trading of Y2K risk token. So essentially a secondary marketplace for, um, for, for the risks that are, uh, the other two products are backing. Um, and just um, a bit on the two new product uh, projects incubated by new orders. So one is Motherboard, which we've touched upon. It provides DAO tooling. Um, and uh, the other one is IVX, which is a new options AMM built on Arbitrum. So um, Yash has actually written an article on IVX for the team. Um, we're still writing it in, a, in, in an unbiased manner, giving our analysis on it. Um, it'll be released by Frogs Anonymous soon um, and by the IVX team, and then we'll publish it on um, our blog as well, and maybe have a podcast in it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so essentially what New Order will do is provide technical fundraising strategy and marketing support um, to these products um, and to these, uh, to these projects. And um, yeah, that's, uh, and, and you can see, you know, through the types of projects that they're incubating, um, what exactly they're going for. So very innovative um, uh, projects that are, um, you know, furthering the DeFi space or actually, you know, um, focusing on the core tenets of decentralization, of, um, or, or, of you know, or, or cross-chain interoperability, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I'll, I'll take a pause here as well. Um, see if you guys have anything to say about these. Otherwise, I'll, yeah, I mean, just um, the, yeah. the projects that they're incubating, you can see that they're all in specific categories and then there are pretty much no overlapping categories, right? So the first one is Redacted. Redacted essentially builds on top of Curve and Convex and allows people to bootstrap liquidity for their specific token pairs on Curve, right? Because Curve, uh, Convex holders accumulate Curve and uh, Redacted ho and Butterfly holders essentially uh, can bribe Convex holders for a, you know for those weekly or bi-weekly votes that they take to bootstrap liquidity in specific pools on Curve. So that's one thing. The second thing is uh, H2O, which is kind of a, a stable coin backed by data assets, if I got that correct. Then is Optify, yeah. which is a yield optimizer. Then there's Y2K Finance, which is essentially insurance for debugging risk. Uh, and then finally, there's Motherboard, which is for DAO tooling. And then uh, IVX, which is an option DMM. And Frog Anonymous is obviously the incubator to be new orders, research, and blog arm. So they clearly have gone after different segments of DeFi. They're trying to look at projects that have been innovative within the DeFi space, doing something original. Clearly, you can see that from the different types of projects they've incubated. So they do have a wider overarching strategy, which you can see at work, and you can see that they are trying to take the space forward by creating new primitives, which is really appreciated in this day and age where VCs kind of just pump and dump tokens based on narratives out there. But 
don't really think about the long term sustainability of their projects. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, yeah, that's uh, thanks for that, Yash. And uh, yeah, I think that we can move on um, to very quickly speaking about the team. I mean, given that it's a DAO and contributors are decentralized, spread out, mostly anonymous, um, there's no team as such to speak of. But, you know, um, New Order was co founded by um, Eden Dhaliwal, who, as I mentioned previously, was head of crypto economics at Outlier Ventures. Um, and, um, you know, I think that his experience is actually very relevant for um, New Order's sake. Um, so it's essentially, uh, you know, they've been part of the blockchain ecosystem. Uh, he's been part of the blockchain ecosystem for a long time, he was the co founder of Toronto Blockchain Week, a mentor at Techstars, and actually, and very promisingly for New Order. Um, the previous founder of XYZ Futures, which is a venture creation firm. So the experience aligns perfectly with what New Order, New Order is trying to achieve. Um, cool. And then now I think let's get into the meat of the next two topics, which are um, the most uh, relevant ones for DAO especially. Um, so the first one we touch upon is the tokenomics. So um, New Order's native token is NUO, and it's got a max supply of $800 million. Um, it seems as if its token distribution is actually fairly balanced. Um, so I'll just rattle off the figures. So the core team gets 20%. Um, there's the investors and advisors get 20%. 5% has been allocated for an airdrop, 14% for liquidity mining, and 38% to the Dow Treasury, and 3% um, for a liquidity, um, probably like a liquidity bootstrapping program or a liquid or a you know the 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 bonding program. Um, for proto protocol controlled assets. So um, the it, it actually seems to be pretty fairly balanced. Um, the core team's got a one-year cliff um, with a four-year vest. So that means, you know, the vesting period starts after one year and it lasts for four years. And um, investors and advisors have a six-month cliff with a two-year vest. Now, the thing is that um, I think that the, the two-year, the um, time period for the, uh, the vesting period for investors and advisors seems to end a bit too soon. I mean, two years and a half probably is not super long, in my opinion, um, for the vesting period to end. Um, although I think that, um, you know, it's been mitigated by the fact that a good proportion of investors are actually individuals um, they, who are investing via the MISO launchpad. So it's not really VCs only um, who are just going to be dumping the tokens. Um, and uh, yeah, 38% of the supply being allocated to the treasury and 14% of liquidity mining seems fair. Um, and I think that the core team and investors and advisors controlling 40% of the token supply is pretty balanced because um, for the core team, definitely it's balanced because you actually need to have contributors um, who are aligned to the mission for a longer period of time. Um, and, you know, actually giving them access to the token supply and, you know, sharing in the benefit of new order by while contributing to it is very helpful. Um, and just, um, you know, another positive aspect is that the treasury will be governed by newer holders, um, which will be a core value accrual mechanism for the newer token. So, um, if the, the, the treasury will be professionally managed, but the newer holders have, um, you know, input into the decisions of the treasury. So I think overall token distribution and release is pretty balanced. Um, I think kind of wait and watch for the vesting period um, for the investors and advisors, um, especially, um, because I think quite a lot of it will be released over the first couple of years. Um, but yeah, that, that's essentially it about um, the token distribution and release. In terms of value accrual, so um, firstly, the new order treasury receives between five to 15% of each incubated projects token supply and new and newer holders are a direct beneficiary of this. So because they're um, exposed to the treasury's growth by governing the incubated projects, right? Um, so the treasury is managed by the treasury sub DAO um, and newer holders vote on the employee strategies including assets like stable coins, large cap cryptos, incubated project tokens, and NUO itself. Um, we'll get on to you know, what the sub DAOs are um, later on in the governance section. And um, holders are also eligible to receive airdrops from new orders incubated projects. So it adds further value to NUO. So essentially, you know, um, the, the NUO token um, 
gets quite a lot of benefits um and the benefits are actually boosted by its v v tokenomic system right so the v tokenomics of vote escrow tokenomic system is one that's become popular over the last year and a bit um and uh, i think we we've, we've spoken about this exact model on a few other podcasts but um essentially to incentivize the continued holding of new tokens um the in this model new holders lock their tokens up for a predetermined wow. period of time and they get perks for doing so so they get exclusive access to governance power so only v, v new holders can participate in governance um boosted token emissions treasury yield and sole access to airdrops by incubated projects so essentially all of the benefits that we spoke about for the new token they they essentially apply to the to the v new holders and and this actually is pretty beneficial for the new new order ecosystem overall um because what the v tokenomic system tries to do is to align the incentives of long term contributors and token holders by making them actually you know hold the token um and lock the token for a longer pe- for a longer period of time um and additionally the v new order token is actually not a transferable token so it won't be uh, it won't trade on liquid markets and therefore it won't be succe- uh, subject to speculative activity so what you can actually think of um for the v new order token it's basically ca- like a kind of reputation score that indicates the commitment of the token holder to new order in a in a very um high level sense that's basically what it is right because you're just holding the token locking it in and the longer you lock it in the more benefits you get because the more aligned you are with the mission of new order now um there are obvious you know uh, drawbacks to the v to the v tokenomics model which is which is firstly a lack of liquidity um and you know the the promise of tokens is that they are liquid but but again i think that we've had to balance out that liquidity with commitment to the cause over the last few years um because we've seen the impact that you know mercenary liquid capital can have um for defi projects and secondly um now let's say that the that some people have bought the new order token um you know basically for speculative activity let's say someone's bought quite a lot of it and they you know locked it up for vnu now it's not the best decision on their part but imagine if that happens and there's a lot of you know locked vnu uh token and the token holder cannot unlock and they don't really care about contributing to governance or doing anything like that um so it might actually end up stagnating governance a bit but i think that this is mitigated by the fact that the core team and investors and advisors actually do hold quite a lot of the um initial token supply and over time um con- uh, contributors should hopefully be aligned with the mission of new order and not really lock up the tokens just to gain you know um emission boosts or anything like that because the drawbacks of doing so um the liquidity especially are pretty obvious and pretty well spelled out so um the, the only people who should really be incentivized to hold vnu should be um actual core contributors to the uh, new order network um now in um in terms of the the emissions boost right um the uh, minimum locking period is 3 months for a 1 1x boost up to a maximum of 3 years with a 3.3x boost so that's the total alignment period um of for for v new holders um and uh, yeah the lock new or can't be unlocked until the end date of its locking period or unless a protocol emergency arises so it's not been defined so far what an emergency actually is um but it'll have to likely pass through governance to implement um the unlocking of the tokens um so there there are some you know backstops and checkpoints and balances towards um the unlocking of new tokens unilaterally um so to date the total amount of new locked is at 108 million while the circulating supply of new order is um, 173 million so if you add those two up you can see that lock supply makes up 38% of total supply which is pretty healthy so it seems that you know they have achieved um somewhat their goal of actually finding contributors who are aligned to the cause and would lock up their tokens for a longer period of time in order to receive um some of the benefits um and also some of the drawbacks um of contributing longer term to new order um so all in all i think that new order tokenomics model is pretty value creative and it's aimed to align the interests of all contributing token holders um new or vnu also acts as an index of new orders incubated projects 
So this gives uh, retail and institutional investors who have a conviction in new order, easy access to investing in the overall ecosystem. Um, and the VNUO system, in my opinion, it helps ensure the longer term sustainability of the DAO. Um, but you know, the success of the tokenomics model really depends on another key component of the new order model, which is governance. And I'll touch upon that, but after, you know, just to see if you guys have any, anything to say, any comments, any, any feedback. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, I guess you've written it here on the note you wrote up is that the new order or the V new token essentially is like a index of all the investments that new order as a network yeah. is making, right? So it's essentially a bet on whether you think uh new orders team has the you know the throughput and the capability to execute on multiple projects and you know at least have some of them be wildly successful since it's a venture investing model so i guess redacted could be the first one if you're early enough to invest in the new token you probably benefit from that but in the future token value will be driven by newer projects uh, you know investing in uh, incubating and it remains to be seen whether long term um, they can successfully incubate these projects, considering the amount of projects they want to start incubating in the future. So if it depends whether they want to incubate a lot of projects and hope some of them hit or incubate a less number of projects, work with them or actively to kind of ensure that they succeed and there's a higher probability of success for them. So. These are all decisions they need to make, and you as an investor need to decide whether that risk is worth it to you and whether you want an index of new order incubated token. Yeah. And I think the people who would mostly want it um, probably would be invest. I mean, like the thing is that over like, over time, if new order just succeeds as a mechanism and as a DAO, um, it, it's just a network effect, right? The more you succeed, the more people will buy it. Now, hopefully that... Um, doesn't really translate and hopefully that doesn't really translate into too much speculative activity and people thinking oh wow new orders invested that means token pump sbf effect haha but like that's you know hopefully that's not the intent with which people buy the token it's to actually have a long longer term view of actually building out sustainable um ventures in this space so yeah um, i guess that's where know. the v tokenomics comes in right it's um... exactly it, it'll, it's like a it's like a barometer of how much conviction you have in your new order as a protocol or as a DAO. The exactly. longer you lock it up, the more conviction you have. That's exactly cool. Um, yeah, said anything to say? Otherwise, I'll move on to governance. No, we can move on. Cool. Um, so yeah, new orders governance mechanism um, uses a pretty standard voting system, but it's got a twist. It's uh, built upon the core tenet of enabling efficient multi-chain governance. Um, so what New Order is going to do is that it'll use a multi-chain vote aggregation module. Um, so it's going to group votes across chains efficiently um, from a gas cost perspective, and it'll aggregate them on Ethereum. Um, and it'll then use this safe snap module that's um, pioneered by, by Gnosis and Snapshot to enforce execution of governance on chain. Um, so safe snap is basically an integration of Gnosis safe, which is a multi-sig wallet um, that's gonna be used to create proposals and snapshot, which is a platform for off-chain voting. So safe, safe snap will essentially allow for decentralized execution of off-chain off votes. Um, so the obvious trade-off is that all, all votes are not immutably stored on chain. But um, New Order seems to have chosen this trade-off to easily enable multi-chain voting, and it's aiming to further reduce the risk by integrate, integrating with Kleros, which is a decentralized arbitration service for dispute resolution, right? So for example, let's say you voted off-chain and you think that your vote is not really counted. You go to Kleros and submit a dispute. Um, I, they've not really integrated this yet, and they're going to integrate this in the next um, couple of iterations. Um, but, you know, I, I, in my opinion, the precise benefits of using Kleros are still to be determined because a decentralized arbitration court for every type of decision, I don't really think it works as much. Um, and also it can be pretty, um, you know, a, a random really um, in terms of the decisions that it, it may make. So there needs to be a lot more detailed analysis done of whether Kleros is actually fit for purpose for this dispute resolution mechanism. Um, but I think that it, it does kind of make sense. Um, you know, uh, it, it does kind of make sense to use the safe snap module 
um, and to you know as a trade off for uh, you know aggregating votes across chains. Um, I, I think that you know over longer term, if they uh, if there's some sort of mechanism um, that you know it, 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 that that easily allows for voting to happen on different chains and then aggregate them on one chain without it being ridiculously expensive from a gas cost perspective, they should implement that. Um, but yeah, their governance process doesn't really need to be too fast, especially compared to protocols like Aave, Maker, Curve, where risk parameters need to be consistently monitored um, and updated, right? Maybe in like a real-time uh, basis for those protocols. For New Order, because it's kind of making decisions that are longer term, so, you know, um, treasury allocation, choosing projects to incubate, it doesn't really need to be especially rapid governance. Um, so there, there, there is a two to 10 day lag in governance proposals passing, but this doesn't really pose an issue. Um, and it might actually, you know, uh, be a bit of a blessing because um, the types of decisions that need to be made can have multiple options that need to be deliberated, deliberated over. And they require, you know, a, as much community participation as, as possible. So it's a pretty good thing in my opinion. Um, that there is actually a bit of a lag for governance proposals passing because it allows more time for, for you know, careful, deliberate thought. Um, right. And the 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 next um, aspect of the governance model is sub DAOs. So a sub DAO can essentially be thought of as a department, right, within a a, a regular Web two company. So there are five sub DAOs in New Order. Um, there's venture, marketing and community, engineering, treasury and governance. And the newest one, Frogs Anonymous. Uh, so Frogs Anonymous has recently been set up as a sub DAO. Um, each sub DAO needs to apply for a budget every quarter, and they appoint a signer for the multi sig. So basically, a signer is uh, someone who approves the sub DAO's decision on proposals. Um, so it's the, the, the and the signers is the um, community leader for or the sub DAO leader, right? Um, so the sub DAO is essentially the community. The community elects their leader, and the leader signs. Um, votes on behalf of um, the sub DAO. So what this essentially is, is a model of representative democracy um, where, you know, you kind of got like a CEO of each sub DAO and the CEO executes decisions on behalf of the sub DAO. But in this model, the CEO takes a lot more input from the sub DAO um, before passing any types of governance, before voting or passing any types of governance proposals. Um, so at Genesis, um, the multi-sig has been constructed as a six of nine wallet. So what this means is that for decisions to pass, six out of the nine signers must approve. Um, and, you know, this just helps decentralize the um, pr uh, protocol and like gives more power to the community. Um, and it enables the community to collectively run the DAO rather than centralizing control in the core team. Um, and uh, yeah, New Order further aims to align the incentives of signers by giving them a salary and a budget. Um, so, you know, a, having a pretty fair compensation model, will go a long way in ensuring that the, the talent that they've got sticks around and it effectively leads the growth of, of New Order. Um, in terms of the budget for the next quarter, right? So what they've done is you can, from that, you can see the compensation per, uh, per you know, signer um, or like per member of each uh, sub DAO is. Um, so each, so for example, the, the venture sub DAO gets each member gets about $20,500 per quarter. Um, the marketing and community one gets 16,625 per quarter. Engineering gets 23,800 per quarter and treasury and governance gets only 12 and a half thousand per quarter. Um, so the amount for treasury and governance may seem low. Um, but both members who are contributing to it are actually part of other sub DAOs. So they're it's just actually boosted compensation for them. Um, but this does indicate that perhaps more resources need to be allocated to this sub DAO, um, to, the, to the treasury and governance sub DAO because, uh, and along with dedicated members, because it's not really that easy to manage a treasury effectively as kind of like a side hustle, right? Um, so I think that maybe there's more uh, people that need to be allocated to this. Um, in terms of the engineering one, they're, they're obviously paying the most, but Comparatively, if you actually look at the cost of, you know, engineering talent and and developers who can actually code in Solidity and other types of, um, you know, Web3 specific languages, they, they, they come at a premium. 
um so you know it's um it, it's pretty it's red- relatively low compared to the cost of engineers in the market so new order seems to have done well there um and the compensation for the other two sub dows uh seems um yeah it seems pretty fair um and the last thing is the voting processes um so decisions over the treasury will be com- controlled by a community driven gnosis safe multi sig so it's a five of nine so five out of nine signers have to approve um and it'll fully mirror the community driven decisions only protecting for ex- from externally malicious attacks um and i think at this stage of development um this protection is needed and over time the multi sig will be lifted to uh, decentralize the protocol and um its maximum level of decentralization will be achieved when or dao operations move to claros and safe snap um again like we've discussed whether this is completely like a decentralized um option but you know if they've got better um opportunities to incorporate more decentralized trustless voting mechanisms they should do so um when when they're available um and overall i think their governance model seems to be well designed there are questions over the effectiveness of claros and the long term use of safe snap and off chain voting um but these issues are relatively minimal um and the sub dao model overall will allow new order to allocate resources more efficiently and further streamline operations and they'll you know sort out their issues over time um especially over things like budget allocation and um the model seems to be a good one um which is a balance between decentralization and scalability so I, i'll i'll stop here again for any comments by you guys not really comments i just appreciate their sub dao model and the fact that they want to be decentralized but also the fact that they want to have some sort of hierarchy to lead decision making i think it's like the perfect mix for now between complete anarchy and complete uh, just power with a few individuals and it's like a it's a step forward in the right direction and other dao should also look at this model and try to learn from it because what they're doing is structuring their dao as five different sub daos and essentially you can look at it as a company right and even a company has specific things it does so for a venture dao obviously uh, obviously the venture sub dao would be working with projects treasury sub dao would help manage their earnings better to ensure long long term sustainability of new order as a whole the marketing sub dao would help either you know projects with their own marketing or they would help new order grow its network and market to more people to get more and more uh, investors and contributors to the new order network and frogs anonymous is just their um it's like their article or blog arm which i think every every major vc fund also also has blogs that they write they have lots of material and new order is doing the same thing too for frogs anonymous so very very um efficient way of structuring a dao and something i think lots of more dao should look at doing agree yeah, yeah i think it's a pretty good model um so so you want to go ahead no 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 go on um i was just adding on to what yash was saying in that i think it's really interesting that we're seeing sort of a convergence between you know how daos are being structured over time versus how existing um organizations are already structured and it might give um you know someone interested in where this will go uh, a sense of the trend right so if some if any uh, individuals are looking to build in the dao tooling space it this might be indicative to you know what they should be building and another thing that's great is the very clear denominations of salaries for the different core contributors because that would give an indication to external people who want to contribute as to a gauge of how much they could possibly earn while doing this as a full time job right because currently i would say there's a at a holistic level there's maybe a lack of faith in daos about about it being like a full time job uh and people would probably tread cautiously before committing to anything full time which is dao related but here you can see that people are actually earning you know salaries that are comparable to normal traditional finance salaries and doing it all on chain in a decentralized way and they can still stay anonymous if they choose to do so which is kind of crazy if you think about it yeah definitely and it's not like they're no, being think- compensated in some some random token or the new token or something it's actual stable coins which you get in your wallet and if you want you can off ramp back to fiat you know 
do all of that and actually live a life by being a DAO contributor. Yeah. No, I think that's a very really important point. Exactly. Cool. Um, right. So I think that now we'll just touch upon the last um, section of the podcast, which is um, just, you know, new orders performance to date and, you know, just, just the, the traction that it's got. Um, so in terms of, um, in, in terms of, you know, the, in this first year of operation, new orders incubated and accelerated 18 projects and it's raised $85 million for teams and seen $30 million in total value locked across its incubated projects. Um, I think that's, these are very, very commendable numbers, um, especially in the depths of this bear market. And they're very valuable for the DeFi ecosystem. So I think like in one year to be able to do this, is it's, it's really good progress. Um, the size of New Order's community is small, but it's growing. So there's 1,194 token to uh, total token holders. Um, so I think that, you know, over time, this should grow, but, you know, it doesn't need to be like, oh, 100,000 people need to join New Order for it to be a success. It's just a way for people to organize and, you know, align on the, uh, on the, on the venture incubation mission, basically, um, that, that New Order is espousing. So I think that, you know, the community is a very important part of this and it is growing. Um, with regards to the treasury, now the treasury, one thing to note is that, um, so I, I think the overall treasury is worth $8.4 million. Seems like a really high number, um, but uh, I, like most DAO treasuries, 85% um, of it is no denoted in its native token, so in new. Um, and, you know, just in the sake, for the sake of conservatism, we should discount this because the entire market cap of new is $6 million and it'll be impossible for the market to absorb the additional new liquidity at current market prices. Um, so let's say that, you know, you had to liquid, they had to liquidate all of their new just to, you know, pay for some liabilities. They wouldn't be able to do that at current prices. They would have to definitely do a fire sale at very, very depressed prices because, you know, the amount of new that they hold is much higher than the amount of new that is currently present on the market. Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, the, the, uh, so there are a couple of different numbers. So according to Dune for the stablecoin holdings, it seems that the amount of stablecoin held by new order is around a million dollars. Um, but looking at New Order's own figures, um, according to them, their stablecoin holdings are, are much higher. So they've got, you know, um, about, uh, you know, one point, uh, no, about, sorry, about $2.8 million of USDC, um, about one point and about $1.5 million worth of USDT. Um, and, uh, you know, if that's the case, then it's a lot more. Um, so that's about $4 million. Um, that's, that's about, uh, yeah, that's, I think about like $4 million worth of, uh, or slightly more over of, uh, stable coins like USDC, USDT. So that's a pretty healthy backstop if it's deployed prudently. Um, but they will have to, you know, as we said at the very start of the episode, be careful about how they deploy and manage their treasury and the runway that they've got from the raises that they've done, just given the market conditions and the difficulty with raising funds um, and, you know, the difficulty with achieving yield on their treasury assets. Um, but overall, I think that new order has gone pretty steadily over the last year. And its most impressive metric is definitely the funding and support it's distributed to in incubated projects. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's essentially it for me about New Order. And just in conclusion, um, I think that a venture development DAO like New Order is very healthy for the ecosystem and its growth thus far in its tokenomics, governance and venture incubation models are balanced and it'll help the DAO grow carefully and sustainably. Um, and, you know, the governance mechanism aims to decentralize as much as possible while attempting to avoid stagnation through the sub, -sub DAO structure and the tokenomics in theory is well structured to effectively align committed contributors. Um, so in my opinion, definitely worth watching New Order. And um, if you fancy contributing to it, um, which we're definitely gonna be doing more of. Uh, so yeah, um, I'll leave some closing thoughts for you guys as well. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, before this I've looked at, you know, different DAOs that I could possibly work at even part-time. And there was no clear route to actually becoming a core contributor. And New Order is like the first time where, you know, I reached out to people in the team and they were really, you know, welcoming and they were forthcoming about how I could become a core contributor, how I could just be a part-time contributor, what would be the compensation, what would be the expectations. 
so even though it's a dao um uh you can talk to certain people from you know you can reach out to people from whichever sub dao you want to work with and they would be very receptive and helpful they probably help you set up a call with them um so yeah one of the better experiences probably even better than just the normal corporate experience in terms of engagement and just clear um guidelines regarding what the expectations are of whatever my contribution is so as from a work point of view i love new order and now looking at their tokenomics and the projects they've incubated i also love it from an investment point of view this is not financial advice it's just my personal opinion but yeah overall i am very bullish on new order as well yeah i mean i i echo those sentiments i just want to add on by saying that personally um i'm i mean this is also um you know you have to take into consideration this is just my subjective interests but i find new order and seed club ventures those two um uh, being the most interesting experiments in um uh, you know as as sadad mentioned venture development in the dao ecosystem so if so those are the two um you know two projects that i'm i'm keeping my eyes on definitely cool. with that uh keep an eye out on new order for or on frogs anonymous for some upcoming articles and also reach out to us if you have any more questions about new order and we can help you yep. yep perfect um yeah and you know watch out for our article that's going to be encapsulating what we spoke about during this podcast um we released i think in a couple of days um we will release the podcast um soon as well so uh yeah great to um yeah you know great to be back great to speak about a pretty innovative um new dao like new order that aligns pretty well with our mission what we're interested in and um you know in in our opinion with the continued growth of the defi and you know web3 space so um thanks for listening in and uh, see you guys next time cheers See you guys. Yeah. Right.